Welcome to the Directing Animation Livecast with Scott Weiser. Now that I'm done directing the development and first episode of the second series of Space Station Animation, I'm joining up with Steamroller Animation to push the boundaries of the art form. Thanks to the support of so many of you, I'm continually developing more than 10 dynamic feature film pitches while mastering the art of telling deeply meaningful stories. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Adam Yaniv. Adam was my first ever, when I got into Rhythm and Hues, into the industry, and I was working on Avatar the Chipmunks 3, he was my first ever animation supervisor. I was already inspired by his energy as an animation supervisor, but then I found out he was developing all these projects and pitching them all over Hollywood, and uh, he's had so many different experiences with various studios, but his most ins inspiring experience, at least to me, is recently he has a truly independent project called Summer Memories, it is fantastic. It's a wonderful, like, refreshing, moving piece of uh, of artwork, and uh, I get to show a little bit of you today. But um, is there anything else you'd like to add to that intro? No, thank you for that intro. That was <laughs> lovely. Yeah, and it's really great to be here with you, Scott. Yeah, I I can't wait to get into it. Um, I think I think actually it's really fitting to show the first clip here. This is wh which episode what is this? Think. What? Yeah, well, launch it. I'm anxious to see what you picked. Yeah, the, the clip I picked, and you won't see it, our audience will, is the clip where he is starting to want to write a song, right? And then you kind of see him do it, and and then, um, <laughs> yeah. So I'm excited to show that to you um, here. So I'll set it up for you. Is, it the, is it the writing of the song? Yeah, it's right when he goes up, mom, 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 and then it starts from there. So what's, what's nice about this particular story is that it's one for one how I wrote my first song. Um, so, you know, there are elements, we'll get into it. There are elements that are more autobiographical that are less obvious in the show and elements that are not. This one is particularly, I think, out of everything we did in the whole season, that's one for one how it happened. Yes. And it's the actual song at the end of the show. So you know how far that we took it. But it's the actual first song I ever wrote when I was 11. Yeah. And uh, Jason here is played by uh, lovely Trisha Black. And we have uh, Roshana Cumberbatch, I think, playing the mom there. And we have Jonathan Langdon playing uh, the brother. And we have me playing the best friend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a great voice work there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's roll it. Mom, mom, mom. Mom, 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 mom. What? Jason, I have some precious time off finally. I'm perfecting my bagels. What is it? How does one write a hit song? A what? Jason, I don't know. It's a verse, another verse, a chorus, a squiggly bit that sounds different, another chorus, and that's it. Okay, great. You can't just simply write a hit, Jason. You have to learn songwriting form. Kids these days, right, mom? Is it a dough? I think it's a dough. It's not a dough. All done. Ah, done what? My song. I did all the parts you said to do. Want to hear? Not really. I just want to... I feel so alone Even when you're near me I'm losing you Oh, wow, Jason, that's actually really good. That's awful and cheap. You know, hits can be catchy, but also have melodic texture. Tim, please. Linda, what's cooking? Are those your world-famous bagels I smell? They're hardly famous, Ronnie. They should be. Check this out, Ronnie. My mom helped me write a song. Nice going, Linda. Let's hear it, buddy. Let's not. Okay, here goes. You just drift away. I try to reach you. Just tell, tell me what to do. And then it builds up. Wow, Jason, I didn't know you were so talented. Isn't it incredible? I'd listen to that every day if I could. It's got a great hook. Jason, I'm gonna need your autograph for when you get famous, eh? Autographs will have to go through Jason's manager. But I was just kidding. But I don't have a manager. Of course you do, it's me. I'm working on being dependable and accountable lately, and from what I gather, those are two critical skills in being an entertainment manager. This is a win-win. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful song. I'm gonna have to ask you to refrain from that humming pregnance. Humming rights are being locked right now. I feel so alone. Hey, anybody want some bagels? Even when you're near me, I'm losing you. All right. <laughs> Wasn't that wonderful? <laughs> yeah, I also, you'll notice I also included a bit at the end 
um, just to show that's how every episode ends is you you get a summer memory that's on the fridge and it backs up and that's the whole that's right. thing that connects all the episodes in the series, which is wonderful. Um, yeah, and you know, a, like a really cool part of the show is that as you get deeper and deeper into the season, um, that fridge plays a bigger and bigger part. The show oh. is really about memories and, and how how we control them and how we remember things a certain way, positively or negatively, and how our friends and our family play into that. Great. Um, so let's talk a bit about the mom. You said you wanted to talk about how you kept her fit, face, face hidden the whole time. Um, what, what, yeah. what were the reasons for that? So... Um, so, I mean, without getting into the reason, cause that's kind of a spoiler. Oh, oh it, yes. it, it's a, it's a part, it's part of the show that he, um, that the mom's face is hidden. It's a little bit of like a adult world, you know, like a, it's kind of a spin on when you're in the, the Tom and Jerry kind of level of a uh, point of view uh -huh. and, um, a little bit of a spin on that, but we just got a little bit more heady with that. We just got a little bit more um, nuance with why that is, and it plays into the story of the season. And from an animation perspective, it was a real uh, challenge to to kind of keep her hidden, but show her. And we really play with that element a little bit. Like there have been characters like that in the past, a little, a little bit like... Uh, um, there was a there's an old show where you had like the guy who was so tall he was cut off from screen, I forget what it was. And then yeah. there was that yeah there was like a, a show in the '90s where the neighbor was hidden, you know. Yeah. So we had a little bit of fun with that character, and in animation we could play it in posing. So you know she always just turns around a little bit, and um, you know you barely see her face, or the hair just covers it like you saw in that clip. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So the you you mentioned to me beforehand, I've seen four episodes of this and and again, like I told you before, there's this really refreshing feeling to it. Um the storytelling really moved me a lot. I felt I felt like I was being taken on an emotional journey as well as like a journey that will help me live a better life, which is, you know, wow. Why I love to I love deeply meaningful stories. That's the kind of story I want to tell. And you said that, that many of the episodes go even deeper than the ones I saw. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you saw I think I think the most advanced one you watched was uh from the midpoint of the season. Uh-huh. And so that's pretty advanced. That's like a big sort of a turn. And you started seeing kind of the larger elements of the story, which is, you know, this is a story about adolescence without spoiling too much. Yeah. Um, um, so it's really a story about a, a kid versus nature is how we look at it. And so there's this kind of battle of good and evil that takes place inside every child. And, um, and you know, it, it was really interesting because we used, the, the show was for me an opportunity to, use um my actual writings my actual musings as a kid as a launch pad for comedy and then to really hold it up whenever you know we thought we got very clever yeah and that we really figured this kid out i would go back to my own jokes from the time to my yeah. own sense of humor and my own writings and me and my best friend really wrote to each other and we made a lot of movies. So we had all of that information and it's not like we took it one for one, but it was really fascinating how, how we get stuff wrong when we remember it as adults. Oh yeah. So that really played into that arc. Yeah. And so the whole season really gets into that. Um, what is true and what is false? What is, what are you editing in your memory? What are you not? And then, what are the positive and negative aspects of that? Because, you know, in your memories, you also have the power to remember the good. Yeah. You can remember, again, without spoiling, just thematically, you can remember the good about people, the bad about people, the good about yourself mm -hmm. and the bad about yourself. Yeah. Uh, the darkest moments can be your um, most educational ones. Moments seep into each other. You can kind of, we played with this idea of, um, you can, uh, not really, but in your memories, you can travel back and forth in time. You, you can, can really yeah. 
in the future. You can edit it. You can create what you want. And that's both a strength and a weakness for a person. So in the season, we really get into that kind of battle against what you perceive as evil, what other people perceive as evil, uh, the fairness and unfairness of the world, how to, how to um, you know, big story point is Jason is, this is a soccer town, but Jason is a musician. <laughs> yeah. So um, we really simplified that idea, but it is about finding your own identity as a kid, finding your own um, place in the world and um, speaking it, being honest about it and and how your your uh, environment really needs you to be honest about it, but also how there's this other side that if somebody doesn't quite understand who you are, it doesn't necessarily mean they don't like you. It doesn't matter. They're just in their own little, they're yeah. in their own memory. Yeah. Know? So That's it really simple. plays with points of view in an interesting way. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not as simple as you're just going from one point of view to the other, but you do see things from other people's point of view and you do revisit memories. And the it's a season that as you watch, especially after the midpoint of the season, really starts to reward you. And that's that's a real point of pride for me. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Is it kind of a hybrid between episodic and an overall plot? Exactly. Yeah. And it was really hard, hard um balance but i i really think we're singular in that way that you can you can watch um every episode every uh every 10 minutes on its own and you'd love it and you know actually from the sample that you've seen you can see that even in the in that pre midpoint uh part the really episodes for for a lot of times it's very simpson-esque that way it's yeah different movies a movie of the week kind of thing <laughs> um but at the same time, you can string along that story. And even cooler, and this was from the inception, and I, I can't believe we achieved it, but we really did. And yeah. I've got to give props to the whole team here. We'll yeah. get into who they are. Um, but you get, to, you get to this point where you can interchange those episodes as much as you want and still string together the arc of the season. And I think by the end of the season, you also get to this place where you can decide how it's pieces together a little bit. So it still leaves it up to your point of view. And uh, I think it's just a very fascinating universe by the end of it. And like, yeah. you, like you said, we get into like deep stuff. There's a character, a re-recurring character of a therapist. I think we're, <laughs> I don't want to say we're first, but we really deal with uh, therapy in just a mature way. We don't make a big deal about it. It's just part of the story. Yeah. Oh, and it's so funny the way it unfolds. <laughs> <laughs> that's and, right you uh, saw the episode. yeah that was one yeah. of my favorite episodes it was a debate like do i show that or do i show this songwriting one uh, i think that i chose the songwriting one because yeah the songwriting is cool but the rest of the episode and how you start to really see oh man i'm, I'm getting goosebumps even thinking but i don't want to spoil anything but no, go ahead. you develop the, the characters in a really interesting way and you start to show this dynamic between ronnie and jason it, okay so here's the question Okay. Were you like Jason when you were a kid and your friend, best friend was like Ronnie? Good question. Yeah. Um, there's a point in the show where, without getting too much into it, they debate exactly what you just said. Uh -huh. and the answer to it is, I could be either. Uh... And um, and that's really that really comes out of the writing. I, I mean, I did have a best friend. And, and I did, like I said, I made this while I was pitching a million things. I made this an experiment in telling the truth. I went every network I was with it because this had a storied history, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, the whole time I kept going, what would we actually say? And I don't care if I like it or I don't like it or it embarrasses me or people tell me that it doesn't sound like real kids. I'm just going to say what I actually, and it was very, very funny to do that. And so you know, out of that process also came this idea of, wow, the way I remember myself, it's like the way you remember yourself is completely wrong. Yeah. And, and, and many times that you're aggrandizing yourself, many times you're selling yourself short. Yeah, I know. And I yeah. This, yeah. And it's amazing because, you know, we just had our premiere in Israel and I brought my best friend up on stage and talk about a goosebump moment. That was amazing. And, you know, you can see it on my Instagram. We had like a little clip of, of, him coming up huh. on stage 
it was really, really touching. And in these last couple of years, because I did that Nickelodeon short, and I, I went to Israel 2016 or something, I showed my friend the Nickelodeon short. There was a, this point where he went, that, that's me? You know? And then um, I said, yeah. And I said, um, you know, I doubt if he remembers this because it was such a throwaway comment. But I said, yeah, you were my hero. And he goes, I was your hero. You're like my hero. He just said it as a throwaway. Yeah. And um, it was a nice thing to say. And just like something you say to your friend. But it made me really think that's how, wow, that's crazy. We see, you see, you see the world completely differently, even though your two kids are so intertwined. We were like inseparable. When I moved to the U.S., when I was in uh, uh, a freshman, um, he came and visited me. We made movies here. We made like a reunion movie. We had everything they have in the show. They have their own production company. I made it very meta. Yeah. <laughs> so I created art production company in Israel, and that's the company that produced this show. Yeah. And so when you you're watching the credits at the end, I think you see the A and N banner. Yes. And you see two, two little kids popping up. That's yep. me and my best. I figured that. I really loved that that incorporation into the logo. That's really ingenious. You know, it brings back something really nostalgic, which is home videos, but it also you know says this is something new that I've created based on a dream that we had when we were kids, which is totally. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, and then, and um, um, it's called Two Kids Plus Dream. That's the yeah. that's the slogan. The, of the company but to get back to your question that really got into um every episode gets really deep um i have this kind of arc where you do comedy 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 and then when you get to that point where it gets sad i go as real as i can that's that's part of this show right mm. so um within all the surrealness that happens at that point of the story we get as raw as we can that's where we spent the most time in the writing room yeah and, always gets into their relationship and as adults really what is happening in their relationship and i'll add this it, you know again it's not always our actual relationship it's kind of the mathematics of writing you know right would we end up in the writing room but it was really illuminating there were a yeah. lot of uh, episodes where i was like wow i am a jerk <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're all we all play the rules <laughs> all the archetypes yeah. we 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 live them out just which one do you yeah, play I the mean, most often is the question but yeah for sure and that goes we go into that thematically oh yeah i'm not surprised <laughs> you're gonna be so excited to see like every episode of this thing it's, it's wonderful uh something else also that i really um at first like the discipline screenwriter in me was like oh should he really include that but i love it um Wait, is that that's interesting in the psychiatrist episode to have the sister come f you know from outer space and they're aliens and like, <laughs> and I know this is based on your childhood, you know, but it's just kind of funny. Like, I think what you were doing was just showing the feeling that you would have of being at a best friend's house. And suddenly it's all new to you. It's all alien to you. Right. And so you're like, Oh yeah, my best friend has it better than me. And so you start getting jealous of them when you don't really see the whole picture. Right. Uh, it was just, it was brilliant. It was, it was a, right. A very fresh take on it, I think. Interesting. That's that. That is very Israeli, for lack of a better. It's like how we tell stories. We have this way of joking, especially when we're kids with our parents, and vice versa, parents to our kids. You know, I'm about mm -hmm. to have a baby, so um, a lot of this was preparing for that. Yeah. And, you know, we were trying during making it and making the show and where, you know, so it was part of like my journey as an adult doing this. So I really thought about how, how I talk to my kid and, you know, and um, this is part of how we tell stories in Israel. We have this kind of whimsy where we can take the emotion and then go very metaphorical with it and make a joke or a character based on that emotion. So I think what you're speaking to Literally, I wrote this when I was uh, back in Nickelodeon. I, I was like, the, the kid who has it all, you got your best friend, and he, he's got everything in the world that you don't have. And we pushed that joke as much as possible. And that was part of the original pitch packet, actually. He's got a sister who battles alien in space. Yeah. <laughs> it just comes just um, to say, you're amazing, Ronnie. <laughs> right. It's just yeah. a way of saying, God. And he says, even your sibling is better. Yes, he does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the story kind of, that's kind of our way of telling a joke, but it's also our way of telling a story. So 
the, the basic format of the show is that story that we're uncovering that first act really takes this kind of twisty turn at the end and uh, yeah it, you start to see it through the through the kid's brain through the kid's memories yeah and it gets as big as it's positive, distorted it but gets, it's fun <laughs> yeah. yeah it's distorted visually but it's it allows you to be very real thematically yeah yeah and that's very similar with the um like we know obviously there's no thought bubble of our heads which broadcasts our thoughts um but there is <laughs> there isn't but right. there is right like you broadcast them by your body language and by your face and you know and sometimes you just speak and as you're speaking you think you're saying one thing but people you're revealing things to people you know and so i love that that about that that episode that you portrayed that where right, people so, can just see I mean, all of his for, thoughts for the people uh listening who haven't seen it that's about um he gets a. Uh, you know, Jason sleeps over at his best friend's house, and the next day he gets a thought bubble above his head that shows everybody exactly what he's thinking. And there's a neighborhood party, and everybody can see who's who he's crushing on, who he's jealous of, who is, and you know, it's it starts, um, you know, really disrupts his life, and he can't fall asleep staying over at his friends. So his mom takes him to a psychologist, and the psychologist has. A little bit of a um, a new way of treating him. He lets him kick his soccer ball around and trash his office. Yeah, and that's the true part of the story. Really, a fantastic psychologist. Wow, really a tribute to him, and he's now a, a very an expert on rage within young boys. So there you go. <laughs> he knew what he was doing. Wow, yeah. that is so cool. Yeah. I was wondering that. I was like, this didn't happen in real life, did it? But it did. <laughs> we could never dream up that kind of method method of treatment. It was amazing, and and just to give that um, therapist props, uh, his name is Mervin Miller. He was an amazing therapist, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and without spoiling just, anything, I love I love the interaction with the the brother later on with the therapist. <laughs> that was just golden. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the jokes. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, we have uh, I, I really think the dynamic between all the friends, not just the two friends, but the five friends, mm -hmm. again, without spoiling, you know, it's kind of the history of the show um, that just the way it came about was kind of this, this these two best friend, two boys show. But it's really about a five person group yeah. and where they're headed. In the Okay. Um, there's a character called Joanna who's a big, big part of the show. Um, yeah. She's probably my favorite. Yeah. Really, um, really. Yeah, just on That's a cool. human level, she's mm -hmm. my favorite. Yeah. Cool. And and it goes into people who, again, without spoiling, uh, you know, you once were friends. Maybe now you're enemies or frenemies, or there's this dynamic in between the group. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, between Jason and Joanna, they're always at each other's throats. Yeah, and I think you saw in the camping episode. Yes, I right? did. Yeah, the episode is all about uh, Linda, the mom, telling them they have to work together. Yeah, so no one gets hurt. Yeah, yeah, that's um, awesome. And it gets into that challenge, but that episode takes a huge turn, right? Because that episode is the first time. You know, I had this rule that you know Jason is the schmuck, is how I say it. So, you know, we don't celebrate the main character. We, we really try to find out where he goes wrong. It's something I really admired. This is a bit of a spoof on Wonder Years, you know, that old show yeah. Wonder Years. But, um, uh, but it's something I really admired about the original show, that, get, that the kid always had to learn where he went wrong. Uh, I thought that was interesting. So I thought we should maintain that. Um, if we're going to spoof it, we better be as good. I think... Uh, you know, without, oh, yeah. without without taking on giants of the of the uh, TV world, uh, I do think we did really well um, in that regard. But in that, so we take this turn between the two uh, kids, and and in that episode, there's actually a moment that we haven't seen the whole season where, um, you know, it turns out Jason was right. Turns out that his instinct was uh, correct and everybody should have listened to him and it actually it actually uh would have saved them yeah and 
uh, in the next episode, which is the flip side of that, we get into the fact that just because you're right doesn't mean you have to be a jerk about it. <laughs> yeah. So that's so that's great. kind of the nature of the show, right? Even if you're right, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean anything if you made people that love you feel bad about it. Yeah. Get into that a lot. That's great. And it's told in a very honest way, you know? Totally. And I see that missing on a broad level. You know, like a, a lot of the stuff I, I see coming out, I just, when I see it, I really enjoy it. They're like, oh, oh, these people are being honest. I think there was a, a series I was watching recently that we have, it set up, like all of the dynamics are set up and you know, these are the villains, these are the, you know, <laughs> and then the best advice that this character needs in a certain moment comes from the person he perceives to be the villain. And I was like, that's an honest filmmaker right there, that they were willing to let the quote unquote villain and actually part of the part of that show is that nobody's a villain you know um it's it's more honest like your show is but uh i just love that i i and i we have a villain by the way i won't tell you who it is oh that's yeah. cool that's cool i'll I say it's not a per it's not a person it's an entity oh um, oh hmm <laughs> it's not it's it's kind of like the nothing in uh in uh, uh never ending story okay it's a, it's a thing it's an evil yeah. that exists in the world, you know? But yeah, I mean, to your point, we really surprise ourselves. And like I said, I could never, I feel so privileged for having been able to do this. The way, and this gets to your whole framing of this whole conversation. How does one get a show like this off the ground? And the yeah. answer is, I'll spoil it for everyone. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, you know, chasing the story, honestly, I, I I can honestly say has been a very rewarding thing in my life, just in general. Um, it helped me during a specific time in my life. It helped me find my artistic voice time and time again. And I'm, I'm not saying it because I planned for it. I'm saying it just because it happened that way, which is a, a very um, meaningful thing to have happened in my life and a very meaningful way that animation really helped my life yeah i'll say that you do see it in the show for sure and it's not just my honesty it's everybody's honesty we had very dedicated uh crew of writers we had um paul b cummings who was my uh um, creative ep worked with me very, very closely the whole time mm -hmm. and um, we were really committed to this idea of not lying yeah. and having that be the joke. And, and, you know, it's very easy for Paul a lot of times, but like, it's very, like, it puts me on the spot many, many, many times because I'm using this auspices of this is, you know, a diary, which is, I'm really just joking with that thing. I'm being very meta with it. Yeah. So, but many, many times, you know, you get like, why are they doing this? And then I go, well, I actually did it. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a awesome. lot of that in the show. But then the rewarding part is people go, oh my God, that really hit me on a gut. Just what you said. I mean, you know, not to boast, but that is what we hear all the time. Wow, that was so real. And that's <laughs> the thing that is really hard to convey to an audience because, you know, you're showing all the ha ha moments. <laughs> and we do have them, but um, but it really gets very, very honest. And every single episode, that's something that I'm proud of. You will, There's not an episode from the beginning that doesn't have a really, really strong anchor point that's emotional and, and honest and new, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, then even more in like sort of a back to the future way, in the uh, eternal sunshine kind of way, you start getting cinematic with it and in and out of the memory which was everything I ever wanted for the show. Yeah. So, for better or worse, it's the show that I pitched, which is yeah. very exciting. That is it's very almost, exciting. It's almost beat for beat the, in terms of the season, the thing that I um, originally put down in the Bible. Yeah. Now for our audience, you know, it doesn't mean that like just the first thing you made magic came out of your fingertips. Like oh. you have, you have a deep history of pitching, 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 hustling, you know, um, without dwelling on the negative, there's a lot of, because of the negative, there's a lot of lessons you've learned along the way that, you know, sure. you've, you've been able to put into this thing. 
that have been valuable. Can you speak more Absolutely. to that? Like what you've learned through the ups and downs. Um, through the ups and downs of, of pitching specifically? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I had a, uh, back when, back when I supervised you, I guess. When, when was that? What movie was that? Uh, Alvin 3, 2011. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I've been with it. That's strange. Cause I've been with Alvin and the Chipmunks since then. Yes, you since have. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, in one way or another, I went to New Zealand, was on the movie and then, I, you know, then I did the TV show as a producer. Um, uh, they, it, or when we were doing that movie, I think I had just set up a show or was setting up a show or was pitching it. And it was like my, I had done a, I had done a feature that actually is being, it's actually is being worked on right now. <laughs> um, Great. Um, I did a feature and I was shopping it around and got it to people, you know, it was, it was doing pretty well. And then I, I pitched something at Disney and then I had a show there. And then that was a, <laughs> that was the one that got, you know, axed pretty early. And I think what I learned from that, I was, I was, Blessed by then, this might be good for the listeners who are really at the beginning of the of the journey. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had learned a lot from animation. Animation, you have to essentially pitch an idea every day. So, yes. you know, you're animating. Uh, you have to you have to go in there in that room. And you have to show what you're doing, and it sucks. And there's no way of stopping it. You know, and you you just have to get comfortable with that concept of oh man which is very hard for somebody like me to show something when it, you're not ready yeah i know <sighs> and that's that and then i got used to it as a supervisor being easy on people being nice to them about it uh -huh. you know and um so it that played into my pitching um uh, experience because when i when i was pitching at disney i sort of pitched as a video which is something that, that i still do i pitch like a video of me talking ah. it helps me tell a story in a visual way it forces me to board it yeah you know um but it get, made me ready for the no or that we want to change this or we want this different and then to speak to the negative of that even in that process i still felt like you know at that at that time i think uh they had gravity falls they were just making gravity falls and they, you know, I got to see some of that process from far away, just a little bit, just to know that, oh, uh, you know, Alex Hirsch has a, uh, he has a, an understanding of this pipeline that I don't. So that really helped me to un just understand that I'm an outsider. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and that little thing made the whole process a lot easier. It also made me stick to my guns where I wanted to, mm -hmm. but without, you know, um, and then, uh, I don't know, I'm just a, a pitcher. I, I got into this, not for directing, I got into this industry for directing and storytelling. I love telling stories like the one we just told. Yeah. And um, so I had learned from all my heroes uh, in both film and music, because those are the two things I'm into, yeah. that you just keep going. And also, if you like the song, or, you know, you like it. If you truly believe in something, I think the biggest skill is uh, that you might lose sight of when you're a little younger, or a little more green, is do I actually like what I'm pitching? Or am I caught up in this like electricity of pitching it? Oh, yes. Yeah. That's important. Very important, I would say. I think this, this particular process challenged my honesty at every turn. Yeah. And everybody around me. And that was really, that's, you learn, you know, in life, you learn to just go say thank you when you go through something like that. You don't, the alchemy of how it happens is so bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. And I love your willingness to say, like, how do you get a show like this off the ground? I don't know. Um, I mean, it's obviously listening to you that it was just, it was being incredibly open, right? And, and also be constantly pitching to an end, like, do I really love this thing? And Summer Memories is obviously something you really loved because you made it happen, right? And uh, 
other than that, you know, just being honest, well, and I think, I think that um, that's a lot more present in old black and white movies when filmmakers would make like 30, 50 movies. I see that pop out a lot more than I'd see pop out nowadays where, you know, you might get one film as an animation director, you know, <laughs> because they're so expensive, you know. Um, well, this, you know, I'll say this. Uh, I mean, to use your, I, 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 I see it maybe a little bit differently. I see it. Please do. <laughs> we're in a, we're in a, or, or I, I, I can add to what you said. I think I'm yeah. looking at the same thing you're talking about the '30s, but I think we're at the advent of a new Hollywood. We're feeling it. So oh. in that, so I, so when I look at myself in that, I feel just so very lucky. Yes. You know, when I was. When I was a kid, or the, the period that I admire, uh, you know, people who were able to exist kind of outside of the, just outside of the system, but equal to are my heroes. You yes. Know? And so there was a big technical challenge here. I really held us to a high standard. And uh, um, it, it was not easy or obvious. And everybody had to step out of their shell and everybody had to get out of their comfort zone. And I really uh, appreciate my crew. Um, we had an international crew. We were working at home. Mm -hmm. We had uh, um, we had Yeti in Canada, in Vancouver, and we had some of our producers in Toronto and the mm -hmm. network in Toronto. The actors were in Toronto. <laughs> I was acting here in my closet, in my old <laughs> new house. But you know, I was. We, we did all this really fast pace and on very very on a, a relatively low budget for what we ended up with mm -hmm. and from the beginning it was about we got to plan this um really well to be able to execute it in the time that we have and live up to the pitch and from the writers we had great writers in toronto as well four of them we kept the room really small that's a tip i guess i can i can say we kept it between me and paul a lot we worked um, kind of like SNL, I had I've done improv for mm -hmm. a long time, and so we would do a writing session. The writer would go away, kind of like Saturday and I'd love to come back with a sketch, the ten pages. Yeah, we we fashion it into an arc that we had already discussed, kind of mm -hmm. um, make sure it's pumping, and then you know finish it on the Friday in one day. On a Monday, we we're already recording the animatic. I'm in my closet playing all the parts. Yeah. We then take the animatic. We give that to the board artist. We start looking at um, board versions. Um, so I'm doing that while we're already doing the next episode in writing. And then uh, lock down the animatic. We go in with the actors. The songs were, so many of those songs were what you're hearing was already what I produced in the animatic stage and then we just switched the voices and did a remaster to it and um re re added some uh, you know violins or whatever we needed yeah it was really cool musically too i mean i i got to do like the song you just that's the first song i ever wrote yeah and in that episode we take it to like a concert at an amphitheater it's really quite remarkable it gets huge <laughs> yeah know. i'm not boasting i'm amazed by it yeah, you know, that's great. Yeah. Uh, one thing I really liked that you said, and it was right as you started to um, uh, not disagree, add on to what I said, um, was that I, I do believe that, that we are on an advent of a new age of, of filmmaking. Um, and and when I mentioned that, like, I'm not seeing this, I'm not seeing that, uh, that doesn't mean that I'm not seeing it independently. I'm not seeing it mainstream, but I am seeing this. Um, I mean, that's why, I mean, I would keep making 10 pitches, 10 plus pitches, right? If I didn't believe like there's this possibility of of getting back some of that energy that we had in, in early early Hollywood stuff where, you well, know. I mean, it's there. There's just so much. But what's different is yeah. that you, you know, it, there's so much content. I, you know, I can tell you is, I mean, look, I, 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 I did this in my little corner of the world. I will say this. To do it the way I'm happy we did it, I needed to be at a um, sort of peak of my technical abilities mm -hmm. on four fronts. That took a long time. I wouldn't have, to be honest, at those other uh, at the other networks where I was making it, I couldn't have done this pitch. I wasn't yeah. good enough. 
You know, that is another uh, part of it, you know? You yes. have to really improve. It's also very deceptive, you know, in animation terms. Um, I really needed to bring my A game early, just in terms of appeal, design, uh, even animation style. There wasn't a lot of time. There was maybe a couple of animation tests where I could influence the style of how we did it. I went deep enough to learn harmony and just started, uh, you know, first we were doing keys, but then I started doing keys, um, like design keys and stuff like that in harmony. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we did it like modular. So I could, I mean, we're still doing it in lock. I can give the team like little modules in harmony and just go either improve on this or use it. So you're still doing it. Are you doing a second season? Is that, uh, no, we're well. We're doing shorts, okay, which is really cool. Yeah, they they're gonna come out next month, I believe. They're kind of in play right now at the network. Yeah, um, but look for them on Family Channel's YouTube channel. Okay, is, we've got a couple of things right now that are showing that are that I think were just unblocked recently. So uh, everybody can check them out. There isn't a whole lot there, but um, coming up soon, we'll have shorts. We did. 20 really really cool shorts that sort of exist outside of the season okay and they're five shorts nice um so we did that as kind of a season and a half and uh um and second season is in discussion i will say this that the first season is a very complete story that i'm proud of and that a second season would be a um it would be a like a part two of that story and that's the fun of the show yeah like like I said, it, it exists as a ten as a ten minute, but it also exists as this. Really, what I'm very proud of is it really does exist as like a six and a half hour movie. And that from a for a writer, that's just fun. It's amazing. You know? Yeah, uh, it is. But to the point about production, it was like producing a movie, and with very little pre-production time, worthwhile for your listeners. I guess um, that coming from VFX and coming from the transition of VFX into character, like before Spider Verse, those kind of days, you know, um, we were discovering character animation at a VFX studio, and um, you were there during that time. Alvin Three was part of that. Um, it was very uh, informative time because I know a lot about when you have no time for pre-production and what to do with that. Yeah. And so. I, I brought my skills to that. I, I brought my knowledge to that. And yeah. uh, it was, it is rewarding. It's re listen, it's really rewarding just from a purely animation perspective. It's really rewarding when um, somebody gets a shot they're proud of. Yeah. You know, and, and you go, my God, I, I'd like, this came from my doodles. Yeah. I, that is amazing. That and is. You're like, everything in here is, we created it from scratch, the, the color palette. We really pushed ourselves. We wanted to not look like, um, you know, but like a little kid's show. We wanted it to really be special, mm -hmm. and really rival the, the big uh, networks and really stand stand toe to toe. That's awesome. You know? yeah. Well, great. Well, my last question in these is usually the get wiser moment, which is if my goal is to get the highest clarity of truth into a story, what approach would you recommend? It sounds like you've already touched on that like multiple times. <laughs> I think sounds like it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Did you have a second part? No, no, go ahead. I think, uh, I think, uh, first of all, for me, as a, as, from a writing perspective, always be honest, tell the truth. It also goes into, um, animation, tell the truth in your pose, tell the truth in your performance. Um, I think that'll set you free. Uh, in in terms of getting it on paper, uh, you know, it's that dichotomy of really keep honing your craft. It sounds cheesy, mm -hmm. but um, keep working on it. Keep working on structure. Oh, yeah. And, and, and then, you know, you discover stuff about your heroes that they're, they're very structured, but they also, you know, you, you get to this kind of place where you can play with the medium. And then that's the place where you have to step back and go, what do I really feel? And not lose sight of it. Not let your technique overshadow your actual feelings. Because mm -hmm. 
that is something that um, I think we we were a bit new in, or or we stand. I, I'm I'm proud to say we did well in this regard. I should say. Yeah. Is um, it's we weren't so fussy about the the visuals that they overshadowed the aspects of the stories that you enjoyed. Yeah. That's how we got that honesty in there. And I'm glad that you picked up on it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for such a wonderful interview. Thank you for making this show. It's fantastic. It's it's super inspiring to me and other people who are going to create hopefully part of this new explosion of, of content that we're going to make coming up. So uh, well, thanks do, a bunch. I'm really excited to see other people's stories. Yeah, and absolutely. Memories when it comes uh, comes around to your corner of the world. Yeah, Just where where right. can we see it now? Right now we're in Canada. I think we're launching in some other territories, um, but I don't want to speak out of turn. Okay. <laughs> we're popping up. You'll see us. I, I believe I've seen some Amazon Prime links in certain places, but we're different, different, you know, different um, uh, vendors in different territories. And uh, and look out for our shorts, which I believe will be just open to all. Oh, and great. Next month. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Well, until next time, I hope we all get a little wiser. Mom. Mom. Thank you for watching the Directing Animation Livecast, hosted by Scott Weiser, audio version edited by Kira Horowitz, copyright Scott Weiser, LLC 2022. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and ring that notification bell.